Good morning and welcome to La Habra United Methodist Church. It's Valentine's Day, February 14th. We invite you to be with us this time and enjoy the service, the music. We just want you to relax and take in all that we can share with you, God's word, his love, and our prayers. Let's begin with just a blessing. Gracious God, we thank you for this time and we ask that you bless us now as we watch, as we participate at home or wherever we may be. Lord, we ask that the music would bless us, the text and the word, and Lord, we especially ask that your spirit would fill us in this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Janelle's here this morning and she's gonna give us the announcements. Good morning, I'm Janelle Cadman, and this is our virtual service for February 14th, Valentine's Day, 2021. If you celebrate, we hope that you have a safe and virus-free celebration. We don't celebrate in our house, that's a long story. Yesterday, or yesterday meeting, we're recording this on Wednesday, so on Tuesday, we had another successful breakfast food drive. CRC is very grateful. Our giving helps the CRC give food to those that are hungry in our community. By doing these food drives, we also are working towards the goal of our conference in helping people develop sustainable lives. We made our goal of 200 breakfast bags for this month. Watch for updates both here and in the upcoming vistas for what will be needed for March. <clears throat> uh, we have, are aware that the Supreme Court has said that we can have inside church. Our conference has not released us into that yet. They are making plans so that we do it safely and keep everybody safe. Just hold on, we'll let you know as soon as we are able to go into the next stage of worship. Making sure I know where I am. Okay, next Wednesday. Can you believe it? A week from today, Lent begins. By the time you're seeing it, it's only in three days. Lent is early this year, so that means Easter is going to be early. But we are going to be doing a very special, very interesting Ash Wednesday service. Pastor Karen and, is her name here, Karen? What's the, what's the pastor's name at the Brea Church? Louis Tran. Louis, Pastor Louis Tran are um, <clears throat> combining together. He has developed a system of drive up worship. So we're gonna join them for the drive up worship and we'll be co-hosting with him and, uh, for the distribution of ashes. Plan on attending and sharing the beginning of Lent with our brothers and sisters in Christ from the Brea United Methodist Church. Now this is the church that's right on the corner of Brea Boulevard and State, Co yeah, and State College. Um, <clears throat> no, it's not Brea Boulevard, it's Lambert and State College. Sorry guys. <clears throat> it's 480 North State College Avenue in Brea. It will begin at 4 p.m. Encourage all of you to be there. I think it'll be very interesting. He does this with car radios and all the instructions will be given to you when you're there. There's a new Lenten Bible study and it will begin on February 23rd at 10 a.m. and we'll be meeting during the six weeks of Lent and reading together the book, What Makes a Hero? The Death-Defying Ministry of Jesus by Reverend Matt Rawl. Books are available in the office. Please call to sign up for one of the classes. We will be meeting on Tuesday or Thursday mornings from 10 to 11. There are still a few spots left, so please sign in. The preschool is now open. We give God the praise for this new beginning. If you have a preschool-aged children in your life that need a wonderful preschool experience, please refer them to our school. Sandy Cram, our director, would love to speak to them or provide a tour. We are enrolling children for our half-day or full-day programs. Call the preschool office and their number is 562-691-9615. Has it changed for 35 years. I still remember that from when my kids were there. Now, point of personal privilege. Bob and I are excited to announce the birth of our first and only granddaughter, a grandchild, Aria Quinn, to the exhausted but pr proud parents, Aaron and David Patinella. Aria decided to come on Sunday, February 7th, 
the 100th anniversary of her great-grandmother's birth. For those that care about such things, she was eight pounds, one ounce, and a week early. Her parents are so exhausted they neglected to ask how long she was. Good morning, happy Valentine's Day. I'm Linda Dennis, treasurer, and this morning I am going to do some readings. But first I would like you to join me, please, for the prayer of transfiguration. It can be found in the red hymnal on page 259. Holy God, upon the mountain you revealed your Messiah, who by his death and resurrection would fulfill both the law and the prophets. By his transfiguration, enlighten our path that we may dare to suffer with him in the service of humanity. And so share in the everlasting glory of him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Praise the Lord for the goodness of his word. Let us begin our time of prayer together as we consider God's presence in our life. On this Transfiguration Sunday, we remember that he's with us in spirit and in power, and we wait for the Holy Spirit. And like the disciples, we wait to hear God's voice speaking to us. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this Sunday. We thank you for the opportunity to be together in prayer. Lord, wherever we may be, we ask that your blessing would come upon us. Send your spirit to fill us and empower us in this moment. Bring healing to those that seek healing, comfort that though, to those who need comforting. And Lord, we ask that your power and your love would fill our hearts and our homes. Lord, we ask your blessing on those around us in this community of La Habra and Southern California and all around the world, Lord. We know that in this moment, still many are struggling with COVID. Lord, we ask that your healing hand be upon them and bless those that bring care and love to them. Keep them strong, Lord, in this time as we begin to receive the blessings of a vaccine, we still are aware that some are struggling and suffering. 
God, we ask that your healing and your love would come and be so powerful that it would change the life, the hope, and the faith of those that are in need. Lord, we're aware that as a community of faith, we have many that are still seeking your healing hand. We continue to pray for Shirley Shaw as she recovers from her fall. The other day when I spoke to her, she seemed so upbeat and so excited that slowly she was getting stronger. We're so grateful for her healing and for your sustaining her in this time. We continue to pray though for her family, for Wes and for their kids and grandchildren as they mourn the loss of Sherry. God, there is nothing that can change the broken hearts that we feel when we lose someone we love, and yet we know that your grace can be su sufficient to sustain us. Lord, I ask that your grace come to them and that their sadness and grief be turned to joy over these months and days ahead, that they remember their mother with love and with grace. We continue to pray for Mary as she continues to recover from her fall. And Lord, we add praises as Janelle shared the blessing of the new grandbaby that was born this past week. Aria Quinn, eight pounds and one ounce, beautiful, healthy, young, beautiful, healthy baby to this wonderful couple. We ask your blessings upon her and on them as they continue to get used to being parents. Lord, we know that that is a challenge and a blessing all at once. And gracious God, we thank you for the prayers that we've prayed in our hearts, those that have been stated and those that are unsaid. Lord, you are the giver of love and you know our thoughts and our needs before even we know them. Together we pray that prayer you taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
The Bible reading this morning is from Mark 9, verses 2 through 9. The Transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of the word. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as we heard earlier, it's Transfiguration Sunday, and why that's important is for so many reasons, but it's kind of the last Sunday before we begin the season of Lent, and it's an opportunity to really understand who Christ is and his role in our life. You know, last Sunday we talked a little bit about the routine of our life and how the 24 hours of the disciples life could be something that was always new and something that always were they were always learning something new we considered that life as it is sometimes can can be routine but the most important question is that we should stretch ourselves and ask ourselves every day what am i doing today to make the world a little better am i growing am i changing am i serving god in the way that he would have me serve those are important questions for all of us as we consider the sort of routine of our life. And these are difficult and even more difficult questions to answer during this time of COVID. We know that that has changed a, a, a lot of the routines of our, the activities of our daily life. Before COVID, we didn't have to think too hard about what we did, but now there's so much to consider. For example, how many of us have been on our way to the store and we park the car and we get out of the, out of the car and we are ready to walk into the store and realize, oh, I forgot my mask. And you run back to the car just to get it. And you realize, oh, so easy to still forget something that we've already gotten used to, but yet our routines aren't set with it. We realize that maybe it's a friend's birthday or it's a holiday that's coming. We celebrate Valentine's today and we call a friend and say, hey, let's get together. And then, oops, we realize, I guess we can't really do that right now. Or then you start to think, is there a restaurant that's open that we could go to? And if we do that, how's the weather gonna be? And is it gonna be okay? And will the restaurant be able to accommodate us? We simply just don't have the luxury right now to be careless with our time or with our lives. We have to be vigilant everywhere we go, everything we do. We have to ask the question, are we wearing our mask? Are we standing six feet apart? Are we being safe? Have we protected those around us and have we protected ourselves? So in this season of changing routines and changing things and each and every day some new event coming, it's been disruptive. It's caused our emotional selves to be a little bit on edge. We've talked about depression and how that has taken over in our country and people are aware of the need to be together and connected in ways that we would have taken for granted before. So much of how we are feeling and what we were doing, I think we could actually call grief. We're grieving. We've lost so much. We've lost people that we love. We're living in a time of grief. It's powerful and it's deep. It's in our minds and we can feel it viscerally in our bodies. 
We can't always put a finger on how we're feeling. Sometimes we're just anxious or unsure or fear, feeling fearful. Sometimes we say, you know, I'm just going to stay home. I'd rather do that because there's so many unknowns. Grief is sneaky. And if you've ever experienced grief in your life, you'll be aware that you'll be having a perfectly normal day and then something will occur to you, a thought, a song, you'll be driving, or maybe you'll see someone and it'll remind you of the sadness that you feel. Someone asked me recently, had I lost anyone to COVID? And while I can honestly say no, no one in my close family has succumbed to the disease, I'm aware that almost a half a million of our brothers and sisters in this country have been lost. Grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, so many souls. So we grieve collectively for those that we may never have known but never would have a chance to know. Whether we've lost someone to COVID or not, we grieve as brothers and sisters. We grieve as human beings. We grieve together. The grief that we're feeling collectively, I think, somehow brings up deeper feelings of grief, maybe reminds us of a loved one that we've lost, maybe at a different time of our life, maybe it was a father or a mother or a grandparent. Grief continues to circulate in our soul, and these events of COVID continue to remind us that we are mortal. We know that those that we love have gone, and on this human experience, we'll never see them again, but yet we feel their presence around us. Things won't always be normal. And normal is kind of a relative term, isn't it? We've, we've learned that normal, our normal routines can be upset in a moment. So relatively speaking, nothing is normal. And really, was it ever normal? And what will normal be in the future? Will it be the same as it is now? No, normal, it'll be something different. I think normal is just a construct that we've created to help us face the unknown of our life. Most of you know, I've heard, you've probably heard me say this, that so much of the time we create control in our life and it's a way to sort of have some kind of sense of sanity about the days and the activities that we can't control. But brothers and sisters, control is an illusion. We don't really have it. And the only thing we have is God who is in control. Even in those times where we're wondering what could God be doing and is, is he even there? I was reading recently about this topic of grief and the grief that we're probably all feeling. And there's a book that I love, and if you have this book or if you have an opportunity to read it, you're welcome to call me and you can borrow mine. It's called The Grief Observed, and it was written in the 60s by C.S. Lewis, an amazing Christian writer. And I'm sure most of you know him as the, he was the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, and, and he's written lots of books on Christianity. He was a, a scholar in, in England. He died in the 60s. So most of his works now are considered classics, and um, a lot of those books are books we read in school or I know some of my kids have read some of his books as well. But the book, A Grief Observed, is different. It's really taken from his journal, his personal journal that he wrote while he was caring for his wife as she was dying of cancer. He's grief-stricken, as he writes in his journal. His broken heart is searching for answers, like all of us who would be struggling with grief or loss. He's trying to ask the deeper questions. And he asks a very important question through his tears and through his sadness. He says, where is she now? Now, if you've read his books, you know that he was a man of deep faith and questioned everything and wrote so that all of us would understand his questioning of his faith and learning about God and who God is. And so it's not a surprising question for all of us to wonder, where is our loved one when, they're, when they've passed away? The question then becomes, is heaven really real? Will I see my beloved again? What will that be like? What will heaven be like? His writing is so deeply moving, and I encourage you to read it. We look into his heart, into his soul, his faith, and the ultimate questions of eternal life that he is grappling with in the book. The scripture we read today gives us more insight to this question of is heaven real and how do we handle the grief that we feel as humans? 
And Jesus answers the questions for his disciples and for us by extension as we read it. What happens next? What will heaven be like? What will the kingdom be like? What will I feel and what will I know when I'm there? Age-old questions. All of us can relate to, to wondering those things and working through our fears and anxieties about grief and sadness and death. The text begins interestingly here. Typically, you would see Jesus and the disciples walking along the road, and he would teach them as they walked, and he would speak to them. But in this story, he's not speaking to them. Something happens in verse 2. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling as white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. So imagine the whitest of whites, the brightest of whites, the white that you can't even quite explain. Probably it's more like an absence of color than a white, dazzling bright. And his face was changed, his body was changed. And the disciples saw this and witnessed it with their own eyes. His face, his body, his clothes were transformed. And then something even more dramatic occurs. Again, no, no teaching by Jesus, just what they see. In verse 4 it says, And then there appeared Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Now, Elijah and Moses had been dead for a very long time. We know in the scriptures that Elijah ascended. He's the one character in scripture that didn't suffer a, a, a death like uh, a human being. But we know that Moses, we know how Moses' story ends. He doesn't even go into the promised land. So these men have been gone a while, many centuries. But in this moment, the disciples see them and understand who they are and talk and hear them talking to Jesus. In that moment, all of the stories of the Israel, the children of Israel and the prophetic word and the, and the history and the patriarchs of the Jews comes into full view for the disciples. Moses and Elisha had been gone so long, and yet here they were on this holy mountain having a conversation with Jesus. It says in the scripture that the men were afraid. They didn't know what to do, but in their human power, they realized this was sacred. This was holy ground, this mountain that they were upon, standing upon. And so Peter says to Jesus, should we build three structures? Should we build tabernacles for them? This is an ancient tradition in Jewish culture where on a day of celebration, you build shelters in the wilderness. It's reminiscent of their wandering in the wilderness for 40 years where they built a tabernacle out of cloth and wood. They didn't have the materials to build a building. The text is silent. We don't know exactly what Jesus said to them or what occurred after that, but Jesus wanted the men to understand the fact that he is the Lord. And the place that they are standing is holy. It's holy ground. And then a cloud descends over them, and they can no longer see. But they're aware of this voice that comes out of the cloud. It's God's voice, and they can hear him say, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to what he says. The men that were following Jesus, these three disciples in particular, were all going to be great leaders of the future church. They were going to be asked to do things that probably a lot of humans wouldn't be able to do, to build a church, to be maybe tortured, to preach and teach in the synagogues, to begin a movement that would become what we think of now as the Christian church. They had to believe beyond any shadow of a doubt that what Jesus was telling them was true. They had to believe he was the Messiah. They had to know that he was the one that they'd been waiting for so that they would have the faith to go forward down from that mountain and change the world. You know, we're all invited to peer into this event as we read this text. This is a text that's so important, I think, in our lives as we think about what is the kingdom going to look like? What is heaven going to look like? We get a little glimpse of that in this text. We begin to understand that time isn't the same in the kingdom of God. Time is not like it is on earth. These were men that had been gone a long time and yet they were there together 
in the same place. They weren't ghosts or phantoms. They were standing and talking, so much so that Peter felt he needed to build them a place to be. But they needed to understand. The disciples needed to know that God meant what he said and that the man they were following, this Jesus of Nazareth, this carpenter's son, was the Son of God, the Messiah, the truth, the Savior, and our King. I think Jesus knew that this event would take them by surprise and probably frighten them on some level. And so he tells them as they're walking back down, don't tell anyone about this until after I've been crucified and risen. So the disciples continue to live out their lives. Some were killed for their faith. They built this beautiful church and the future that would bring us to this day, this Transfiguration Sunday. They suffered. And yet they knew in their suffering later that Jesus was the Savior. He was the Messiah and that they would see him again. Jesus promises us in the scriptures that he will go before us and make a place for us. Heaven is real and he'll meet us there. He's our King and our Savior and the teacher and lover of our souls. So each and every day we follow him. We listen for his voice. We're encouraged to understand that Jesus is speaking to each of our hearts when he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. I'll be there with you. I'll guide you and I'll lead you. Of course, none of us can know the future. We know that Jesus, like the little baby that we're celebrating this week, Jesus was there with her at her birth. Jesus will walk with us through our lives at every moment, the good and the bad, the feelings of grief, the feelings of sadness, the feelings of fear, anxiety, whatever we're feeling, he is there to hold us. All we are required to do is turn to him, to fall to our knees and ask him to be with us, to remind us that he is our king and our savior. So I invite you this week, as we think about the transfiguration, let us walk up the mountain each day with Jesus spiritually. Let us imagine what that might have been like for the disciples and for us to walk along that path of our life with him up the mountain to where we see miracles and we understand the power of God's love, that he is there to, to transform us, to heal us, and to bless us. He meant when he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let grief overshadow you. Know that I am Lord and that I have already solved the problem of where we will be and what the kingdom will look like. It's your job to believe and to follow, to love me and to love your brothers and sisters and share this good news with them as you meet them. Make sure they know that they are loved and that I am there for them too. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the lessons you've taught us. We thank you for the reminders that even in our darkest moments, you are there. You told us you would never leave us or forsake us and that you would hold us close in our times of struggle. Lord, we know that you've promised us joy in the future and a kingdom to come, that heaven is real and that you will meet us there when it's our time. So Lord, let this story of the Mount of Transfiguration remind us of your glory, of your greatness, and of how you love each and every one of us today and forever. Amen.
Thank you for being with us this morning as we celebrated the transfiguration of our Lord. He's our King and our Savior, and he wants you to know how much you are loved. In this moment, in this time of trial, as a country we're going through so much, he is our Savior and King, and he is in control. Let us put our faith in that and let us know that we are loved. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may we go into the world to be blessed, but to be a blessing. Love and care for those around you. Stay six feet apart and still wear your masks, but we are excited to hope that soon we'll be together again. In Jesus' name we go. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.